Okay, well, it looks like it's about 2.02 Eastern. I'll go ahead and get started. All right, so first and foremost, we have a couple more Sporlin Tech Talks coming up in August. We're going to be talking about ZoomWalk. And then in September, we'll end out summer with the operation and selection of solenoid valves. Okay, so please note, if you do not have sound via your computer, we do have a dial-in, which was included in the invite. Please mute your microphone, which they should already be muted. Um, if you do have any questions, we do have a question and answers page that you can submit them, and I'll get to them throughout the presentation. And for everyone's reference, this webinar is being recorded. Now, first and foremost, my name is Henry Papa. I am the Sporland Sales Engineer out of Florida. And if you have any follow-up, if you need anything from this presentation, my email address is henry.papa, P-A-P-A, at Parker, P-A-R-K-E-R, dot -E com. All right, so today in this training module, uh, we're going to provide details on the system used for identifying Sporland TEVs, or expansion valves. It'll show how each segment of the nomenclature for a valve describes a different aspect, which will be important relative to selecting the proper valve for different refrigeration and air conditioning applications. All right, so throughout this, some of the takeaways, you'll be familiarized with our nomenclature. You'll learn when an internally versus externally TEV should be used. And you'll also be taught the importance of selective charges in the power heads. All right, so for many years, Sporlin has provided OEMs with TEVs for a wide range of applications, going from comfort cooling to ultra low temp refrigeration. Uh, valves have been supplied in many different capacities with ever increasing number of refrigerants. And as a result, there is many different TEVs out there. And so there's no scarcity of different characteristics which must be considered. Now, fortunately, we have a pretty good system for our nomenclature um, to designate the TEVs. Okay, so some of the characteristics that our nomenclature covers is the body size and style, the refrigerant type, the capacity of the valve, and the different power element charges. All right, so this is a snapshot of our nomenclature. And you can see it is all segmented, and we're going to talk about all of these individually today. Now, the first portion of our nomenclature is the valve type, or you may see it referred to as the body type. This could be one up to three letters long. The second segment is our refrigerant code. You'll see that all the common refrigerants here have a letter of the alphabet associated to it and different colors as well. Following that is the equalizer. If there is an E present, that means it is externally equalized. Without an E, that means it's internally equalized. Next, you'll see a dash in between the equalizer and the nominal capacity in tons. So just remember, nominal capacity is what the valve is tested for under specific conditions. It's not always going to be the case. Following the nominal capacity is another dash, and then it is the thermostatic charge. The thermostatic charge is the power head, and it's going to relate to the refrigerant as well as the application, the evaporator temperature that you're working with. Then followed by that is all of the connection sizes, the inlet connection by the outlet connection, by the external equalizer connection size, if present, and then a dash and our capillary tube length. So the first thing we're going to start with is the body type. And again, the body type or the valve type, the valve family, could be one letter, could be two letters, up to three letters. Now, see in this example, here in the left is the type R valve. The basic type R valve has flared connections. Now, when you come over and add E as a prefix, that means it has extended ends. ODF sweat connections. And over here in the far right 
is the type SR. The S designates an inlet strainer, and that's what this is right here. This is an inlet strainer, which can be easily serviced or cleaned. Um, that's great for supermarkets. That's great for any refrigeration that needs uh, routine PMs. And this is the same nomenclature that is going to follow with our Q and BQ valves, the build valves that most of our wholesalers carry, as well as some of the other valves we have. Now I did mention some of the body types or valve types can have up to three letters. So I wanted to go into an example of where you will find three letters. So in this example, we have a type S valve. You'll see the basic type S valve is already sweat type connections. By adding an E as a prefix, that means that we have extended ODF connections. And that B here in the middle, that's gonna designate that it is a balance port valve. Now, following along with the nomenclature after the valve type, we have our refrigerant designation. So as you should know, as you know, refrigerants are abundant in the field. There are many different refrigerants in the industry for a wide variety of applications. And TEVs have to be designed to account for all these different refrigerants to be able to handle at the correct pressures and temperatures. So this is a highlighted refrigerant code right here. As you can see, every refrigerant has its own different letter. And you'll see to the right of that refrigerant, there are its own different colors as well. So an example, in this valve here, it is a ERZE-2-GA. We know that our valve type is an ER, so Z is our refrigerant code. If we come over to the code, we see that Z is 410A, and you'll see that the color should be rose. So if you are familiar with our expansion valves, you're familiar with our power heads and the stickers on top of them, you'll see that the sticker is colored that rose color to also indicate that this is for 410A. And you'll also see this on the boxes as well, on the box labels. These will be color co coded to show what refrigerants these expansion valves are good for. Okay, now following the refrigerant code, we have the internal versus external equalizer. So in this example, we have two different valves, the same family. We have an ERVE-2-C. And so after we have our ER body type, we have our V refrigerant code. And for those of you astute and familiar with Sporlin, expansion valves, you know V is for R22. And since there is nothing after this V, we know this should be an internally equalized expansion valve. Now over on the right, by comparison, we have an ER, V, and it has an E here, indicating that it is externally equalized. Now this is something you can physically see on the outside of an expansion valve. You'll have an inlet port, an outlet port, and this third port is our external equalizer. Okay. And so I know we discussed earlier that we would talk about why we would use an external equalizer versus an internal equalizer. Okay. So let's think about what the equalizer does. The equalizer is a passageway for evaporator pressure to push back on the bottom of the diaphragm in the power head to close the valve, okay? However, internally equalized expansion valves do not account for pressure drop, whether that be across a distributor or in our evaporator coils themselves. And so in this example, if we were to measure superheat, we take our temperature reading here. At the sensing bulb, we see that is 43 degrees. Our suction pressure here is 55. Using our PT charts, we see that we have a 20 degree saturated suction temperature. So to find our superheat, we just have to subtract. 
So 43 minus 20, and we end up with 23 degrees of superheat, which is way out of the range for a medium to low temp application. Okay, and the reason being is this evaporator is being starved. Across this evaporator is a 20 pound pressure drop. Now by using an internal, internally equalized expansion valve, you're seeing 75 pounds pushing up, closing off the valve, which is too high because the evaporator is running only at 55. And so by using an internally equalized expansion valve where there is a pressure drop, you're starving the system. And that's why we use external equalizers to account for this pressure drop. Okay, so instead of seeing 75 pounds pushing on the bottom of the diaphragm to close the valve, now we're seeing the 55 pounds that's actually present in our evaporator. And so what that does is bring down our vapor temperature, leaving our evaporator. So we have 30 degrees minus this 20 degree saturated temperature which gives us 10 degrees of superheat, which is normal. Okay, and this is the same for distributors as well. Distributors have roughly 30 to 45 pounds of pressure drop across them. So that pressure change makes a large difference in trying to maintain a constant acceptable superheat. All right, and now that we've talked about the internal or external equalizer, now we have our capacity designation. So the easy way to figure out what your capacity is by quickly looking at an expansion valve is to look for these two dashes. So we have an ERZE dash two dash GA. In between the dashes, whether it be a number here on the left or letters here on the right, that is gonna be our nominal capacity. Okay, and just remember, nominal capacity is a valve's tested capacity at specific conditions. 100 degree liquid, 100 pound pressure drop, 40 degree evaporator. So as you fall away from those conditions, that's when this nominal capacity seems to differ from the actual capacity of the valve. And I get a lot of questions on, well, why does this valve here on the right have letters for its nominal capacity? And that's because this is a balance port valve. Because of the design of balance port valves, they can handle a wider range of nominal capacities because it is balanced because it's steady throughout that range. And so we can't simply give it a number nominal capacity, and that's why we go with numbers. Okay, and then after our nominal capacity, following this second dash here, we have our thermostatic charge. Okay, so a power element's thermostatic charge must have a pressure and temperature relationship, which is comparable to that of the refrigerant in the system. In this chart here on the right, this highlighted desired superheat range is just showing the performance characteristics of each different charge that we have at different operating temperatures. Unfortunately, we do not have a universal power head that can handle all different applications as well as all different refrigerants. They're all specific. And so you must cater your power head to the application you're working on. Okay, down here at the bottom left, we talk about the most commonly used charges. Okay, what you see here, GA and CP, are typically used for air conditioning. So in this valve up here, ERZE-2-GA, we know that this is an air conditioning valve. I like to see GA as general air conditioning. For medium temp, we use C. I like to look at C as cooler temperatures. For anything lower than that, we have the Z and ZP for low temp applications. Okay. For those of you familiar with our Q and BQ valves, the build series, because these valves are modular and the, they do not know when they're being made what refrigerant they'll be good for, we call these out a little bit differently. Because the basic valve body, let's see this example right here, SBQE, 
That is just the valve body. We use an A size cartridge and we put this VC here. That V is the refrigerant code. It doesn't show up earlier in the part number, again, because this valve doesn't know what refrigerant it's going to be used on when it leaves a factory because it is modular. Okay, and the same thing you'll see for our power heads. You'll see it has a standard nomenclature of KT dash, a number for the size of it, 43, 45, 83, 53, dash, the refrigerant code. So in this example, Z, again, for 410A. And then GA, that's the thermostatic charge that we just talked about. That is for general air conditioning. So this is an air conditioning power head. Okay, and the last segment of the expansion valve nomenclature is the fitting and cap tube dimensions. Okay, and again, it is very straightforward. We have the inlet size by the outlet size by the, the external equalizer size if it's flare or sweat and the cap tube length. Okay, so a couple things to point out. These sizes are in eighths of an inch. So three by four by two means it's three eighths by half inch by quarter inch. Okay, if you have an S after the inlet size, that means it has a strainer on the inlet. The ODF, again, means outer diameter female. So this would be your sweat type couplings that you would insert your line set into. Over here on the right for flare connections, you have a two by four SAE. So the two means quarter inch by half inch. SAE means it's flare. You'll notice there's no third size here because there's no external equalizer. And then you'll see that this cap two length is only 30 inches versus over on the left, which is five feet. Okay, so that is it for the presentation. Um, one of my tips that I give my new wholesale counter staff is to familiarize with the, with the different valve types we have. Um, again, because they could be one letter up to three letters long, it could get pretty confusing if you read the valve from left to right. So I like to start from right to left. So in this example here, let me annotate this. So in this example, the ERZE-2GA, I look from the right, I see GA, and we talked about this. This is an air conditioning valve. Then I come over, in between these two dashes is a two. So this is a nominally two-ton valve. Then another dash, we have an E present. So that tells us it's externally equalized. And of course, you can always look at the valve itself. If you have three ports, then it is externally equalized. Prior to this E, we have a Z. And that's going to tell us this is a 410A valve. And if we can do that, just consider everything before that Z, the valve type, even if it's one letter, two letters, or three. All right, and so that sums it up. Does anyone have any questions? And if you do have questions, please use the question and answer box. I guess we don't have any questions. So I just want to go ahead and thank you for your time today. Thanks for stopping by. Hope that helped. If you have any questions, again, you can reach me at henry.papa at parker.com. Thank you.